Good morning, everyone. Mike McConville here again, Stratford, Ontario, Canada, for String Tech Workstation. And what we have here, many would consider, certainly those in the jazz world, this is the most iconic of all archtop guitars. Because under the guidance of Lloyd Lohr, when he came on board, he was the first guy to actually put F holes into the top of a guitar. So in other words, this was the very first model of guitar to be built in the fashion of a cello with a carved arch top, a carved arched back, and F holes in the soundboard. This particular model is a 1929. The original foot of the bridge is there. We have three other bridge caps that we can kind of play with to line up the intonation perfectly on this. It's in pretty remarkable shape for 1929. It has had some previous work done, some work executed very well, and some other jobs that were not executed quite so well. But we have a sheet of this perloid. This piece obviously was replaced. It fell out at some point. Uh, so it is going to be replaced. I'm just in consultation with the customer right now to determine whether we'll just do the whole fingerboard for consistency. We have enough material to redo the fingerboard completely so that we have uniformity and I think that's probably the route we're going to go. This will also be getting a complete refret. Uh, these frets are pretty well fried. Amazing that they're still in there from 1929. There are a few places around the binding where the plastic is kind of loose and letting go. Other than the complete refret set up and then an intonated bridge cap, uh, there's a multitude of other little things that we're going to take care of as we move along with this guitar. And as always, on the Patreon channel, you'll be getting a play-by-play -play in this whole job, A to Z. Before we loosen the strings and pull the bridge off in preparation for that refret, we're marking the footprint of the bridge on both sides. As is very common with these early arch tops, you can see the sort of crash marks of that uh, tailpiece. This is actually a fairly heavy brass bar, but we're going to, again, with very, very low tack painter's tape, we're just going to kind of hold that in place while we remove the frets. Well, my customer just emailed back and he agrees completely. Look at this. This is just flap it in there. This one is horrible looking. Somebody put that in. It has nothing to do with the original inlay. This one's loose. This one's loose. We're removing the frets, truing up the fingerboard. Why not completely do the inlay? Then we'll get a nice consistent color end to end. And that's exactly what we're going to do. I'm down to the last fret. Most of those frets came out pretty clean, but before I pull this last fret, I just wanted to point out all this crumbling and breakage. That's from the last guy. So there are really only two places that were kind of bad here. Uh, obviously, this inlay, you can tell by how easy it came out that it's been in and out of the guitar a few times. So just want to show you that before I pull that last fret out. So we're going to start with cleaning out those cavities, getting a nice crisp piece of new inlay. We, after talking with Denny, we decided, you know, the easiest thing and the cleanest thing is to replace all of these so that we have a nice uniform consistency along the length of the neck when we're done. So this is the first step. There were actually a few places on this guitar where there was loose binding along the edge of the fingerboard and around the bodies. Now this was 36 hour cure and I left it the full 36 hours. I'm taking no chances with this. Those inlays are done and they're never coming out. Let's pull these clamps and capos and cowls off. and. There's a radius on the bottom of that call. It's over radius actually. And for the wider block inlay, I, I sort of doubled them up. That's looking good. Just slightly proud. Beautiful. Okay, same thing here for this wider inlay. I kind of use the double calls. This one I got away with one. This one I got away with one. We'll basically be leveling this, respecting the original radius, and bringing those 
inlays flush. Now they are just proud about 12 thou best possible case scenario. Very happy with that. So we'll keep you in the loop as we move along. Thanks again for your Patreon support. Cheers. Uh, you can see there's a gap here between the plastic binding and the nut that I'm about to ease out because I need to level that fingerboard. So that gap is indicative of how much plastic shrinks over time. This is one of the main reasons that you get these breaks in the binding and binding falling off because the wood swells and contracts much quicker and much more regularly than the plastic. So something's got to give it that joint and if it doesn't the plastic will crack. Another example, plastic and wood, is it a marriage made in heaven? Nah, not exactly. It still looks beautiful though. Just pointing it out, it's just nature of the beast. I am going to be heating this up and removing that because we need to go full length. So we've got a hundred year old truss rod still perfectly functional. As I mentioned in my level two classes for years, we're about to do a complete refret on this and true up the fingerboard. You gotta make sure you got a little bit of load on there before you do your leveling. We got just enough heat on there. Kind of ease this out. This is the original nut, it's never been out. Ooh, yeah, baby. And that's what we got. <laughs> that's, they got a perfect press fit on this thing. Beautiful. The most important thing right now is we've got clean access to the full length of the fingerboard along the trajectory of the string path from the edge of the nut right down past the last fret. Now we're ready to start this leveling process. So I'm just going over very gently at first. We're really kind of bringing that inlay down because I, I put that inlay in and purposely so that it is just a little bit proud of the actual wood, the fingerboard. So just take it up. This is kind of my first run at this just to kind of get a read on how we're doing. That plastic inlay, that'll be scraped with a razor blade to bring it up nice and clean and take out any scratch marks. Now we'll bring you in and let you have a look at this. I've got this level, I'm going to run the straight edge along there in a second and show you, but there were two real craggy sections of the fingerboard where uh, the damage had already been done in the past with the ninth fret position and the 12th fret position. Let me bring you in. It sustained quite a bit of damage on one of the multiple attempts to fix the inlay over the last 90 years. Uh, the ninth fret also I'm going to have to pick away at it because I'm going to mix up some ebony dust and fill that in so that when it's all done It'll look like nothing ever happened. Okay, I've got my straight edge here and just checking that all the way across. We've got a beautiful conical radius. A little bit of fall off at the top end here, which is beautiful. Yeah, no, that's great. And there's lots of adjustment on that truss rod as well. Using the sanding blocks that you've seen me use in other videos. Just checking that all the way across. Good contact on that straight edge. Loving it. We'll go over that with 120 grit lightly. Step it up to 180 grit. I'll scrape those plastic block inlays nice and clear, get all the scratch marks out. So this is that damaged area that I was talking about. This is the 12th fret and then the 9th fret, same deal. If it's shallow enough, I may be able to get away with ebony dust. And as always, you get a play-by-play. -play. I have to bring you in and show you this because this is just, look, just crumbles out. That's just junk he put in there. I guess it's mastic or uh, lacquer stick or something, but uh, look at it. That's not wood. Some previous attempt at doing this inlay, probably several times over the last 90 years, this needs to be taken care of now before we go any further. And it's the same deal here with the ninth fret. See this? That's not wood. I think he's put lacquer stick in there. I've got to bring it down to the wood. Now, of course, I went across this first and got the fingerboard level along the string path. And now 
I'm going to have to fill this before we put the frets in. I'm bringing you in for the second fill. I've already filled it once and I've filled this one once. So I'm coming in second time through. I've got my ebony dust, just putting what's needed. Just kind of smooth that out. And then on this side, same deal. I've already filled it once, but I'm filling it now for the second time. So I've got that polyethylene dam prevent anything from sticking to the fret slot. Now this is that glue boost stuff. <laughs> I don't mind giving them a boost. This stuff works great. I've used it a few times now. Uh, Peggy White, a luthier guitar builder from Ottawa, distributes it for, uh, for Canadian builders and techs. Pretty cool stuff. So I am doing as much damage control as I can right now. This is the glue boost accelerator. You just give that a couple of shots. That'll set instantly and now I'll be able to kind of level it. I have a fill to do here. I have another little fill to do here. The rest I'm going to be able to do after the frets are in. I'm set up right now to do this side of the inlay because when I put the glue on, of course, it wants to run downhill. I'm going to tilt the guitar up the other way to do the other side of the inlay here. And then there's another, another spot here we've got to do. So with the razor blade, I'm just going to kind of scrape that flush. And this one too. Scrape that flush. So I've built up that wall of the saw kerf now so that I can at least put a fret in there without that edge crumbling. So when I clean these slots out, I drop that uh, Japanese flush cut saw into the slot and I push with this hand, I pull with this hand. I have the saw against my chest so that my body weight provides the inertia against that saw cut, so prevents it from slipping. And this prevents damage to that very brittle 90 year old plastic binding. This saw just happens to open up the saw kerf to 22 thou. Perfect size for the fret wire. I've got the, the guitar now sort of slanted in the other direction, right? So we'll bring you in. I've got uh, the other side of that uh, ninth fret inlay. I've got my little polyethylene dam. Just taking a brush and just kind of brushing off what we don't need. This is our first fill on this side. I did two fills on the other side to, sort of to get it up to level. So, there's our glue boost. They give you this little a miniature applicator, which is kind of cool because it allows you to drop a controlled amount of uh, super glue in there. Good. And then over here. Give that uh, couple of blasts, and then we can pull our dam, pull out our little polyethylene dam. So we'll need to clean out that saw kerf again because we've got to do a second filling with some uh, heavy dust. So that was our first fill. That was a very heavy fill. So I'm going to put the dam back in and then do a second fill. This was the other one that I did. That was one of the worst ones. Okay, here we go again.
Now that we've got the edges of those saw kerfs built up to be able to handle the underside of the crown of the fret, we're going to do our final leveling along the length with 180 grit and then we're going to start putting frets in. Most of the frets are in. I have purposely stopped for these last five frets because I want to bring you in tight and show you precisely how I do this. So you can see now all that nasty crumbling stuff you saw earlier in the video it's gone forever. These are a 51 100, 100 thou wide, 51 thou high. This is the folks at Jaskar in New York. Uh, this is where I got this from. We're going to bring you in close and show you precisely what's involved in doing a fret job on this guitar in particular. This is the Japanese flush cut saw that I use to drop in right tight to that binding while I clear out that fret slot and get it ready for the new frets. You really have to be super careful. Get a guitar of this vintage, like it's nine, almost a hundred years old, 90 year old guitar. That plastic is super brittle, very easy to break. Making sure that there's no obstruction in those slots. So when we go to tap the new fret wire in, it goes in perfectly. I've started with that overall length. We've clipped off that tang and the underside of that extrusion, it never brings it dead flat. So we're going to just bring that right flush, clean that off. So next what I'm doing is I'm sort of grabbing hold of that tang with those flush ground end cutters and I'm kind of flexing that fret wire so it's a little bit over radius. A little bit higher radius than the actual fingerboard. I'm verifying that tang so it comes close to the plastic binding but not so close that when you drive it home it pushes the binding off. Got to be very careful on this one. Once again you got 90 year old plastic binding here. I'm liking that. Let me bring you in for sort of bird's eye view for the tolerance. So that's the tolerance we're after as far as length goes, overall length. So this disc sander, I actually control it with a foot switch. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm kind of mimicking the approximate bevel. So we're continuing with this 1929 Gibson L5 to go over all of the idiosyncrasies around doing a flawless fret job with the uh, very brittle plastic binding, cutting the overhang, etc, etc. So we're going to bring you a little bit closer and we'll continue with our very detailed step by step. You can see how over radius that is. A little bit extra overhang, not too much. Those ends have been polished, that overhang, so that when we go to true it up, we're not going to jar the fret loose. That's good. It's in nice and tight. Okay, so first step is to cut that fret just a little too long. So these are the tolerances we're talking here. That's our next tolerance. Next, we're going to nip off the tang on either side. Okay, here's our next step. Kind of nip off that tang on the underside. Next step, we're going to clean off the remains of that extrusion on the underside of the crown so it is flush. Other side, same thing. There's the side view. So we've basically cleaned off the remainder of that extrusion of the tang on the underside so it's dead flush. Next step. So what I'm doing next is I'm cutting off the overhang. Before I cut it off, while I can get a good grip on it, I'm flexing it just a little bit. Then I cut it. Other side, same thing. Grab onto it. So you flexed it that little bit. Then we clip it off. You'll see in a minute why I do that. In this next step, this disc sander is on a foot control. So I, I'm just getting it to spin and I'm just touching the end of that. I'm cutting the initial bevel of the crown. Next, what I'm doing is I've loaded this canvas strop with the jeweler's rouge. I've also got this on the foot control and I'm buffing. 
the end of that crown to soften that edge so that when we file it flush, there's no snags or anything to catch. This is actually soft to the touch. When I do that cross-sectional filing, there's nothing to grab or snag on. These are the tolerances we're aiming for here. So that tang is just slightly back from the binding on both sides. And it needs to be because when you drive the fret home, it flattens and actually lengthens slightly. And you do not want to bust off the binding on this beautiful vintage guitar. Err on the side of caution, you're better off having that tang being a little bit further away from the binding than too close. There is one last step I'm going to show you. So I'm dropping in there with a slurry of wood glue, just regular wood glue. Are we gluing the fret in? No, not really. You're not, you're not gluing metal to wood. Not with this glue anyway. But what we are doing is we're filling that saw kerf. So what happens is either side of the saw kerf is end grain. And even end grain as tight as ebony will wick up that glue and swell up a little bit. So what we're really doing is we're encouraging the saw kerf to swell up and grab that fret. Okay, we've got that fret over radius and we're ready to drive it home. Beautiful. The neck support on the tech deck acts like a huge shock absorber and absorbs that hammer blow while supporting the neck when you drive those frets in. That's the tolerance we want. Beautiful. I'll nip off that tang. Check that again for tolerance. Yeah, looking good. We'll level that extrusion on the bottom. Beautiful. So again, the glue is just used to swell the end grain. It grabs the tang or the bead of the fret, swells up and locks. And it is a beautiful thing. We just got the slightest little bit of glue squeeze there. Get that up. Steel wool. Oh yeah. Liking it. Home stretch last fret. That's our initial tolerance. So we'll clip that back. Here's our next tolerance. So we've left enough just to notch out that overhang. Clip off that tang. Check it one more time for tolerance. Yep, that's looking good. We'll clean up the underside of that crown. Flex that fret wire into an exaggerated radius. So those outside edges are nice and tight. And once again, while well, we got something to grab onto, we're going to clip off that overhang. While I've got something to grab onto, I can actually just coax that down a little tiny bit. 
and that guarantees those outside edges are going to be dead tight. Beautiful. Little touch up on the on the sander. Touch up on the buffer. We'll triple check that slot to make sure there's no obstructions. Looking good. Here's one more tip I want to show you when you're dealing with ebony fingerboards. Oftentimes the tang and bead combination is maybe just a little bit tight. Well, I've got a set of end cutters, so I've blunted the blade on both sides of those cutters so that that allows me to crush the bead of the fret and get a beautiful fit into that ebony. Now with rosewood, a lot of people don't realize that the ebony is a lot harder than rosewood. And rosewood, because of its inherent resins and oil in the wood, it actually allows the fret to kind of slip in, you know, when you drive it home, whereas the ebony is much drier and more susceptible to chipping. And as you could see earlier in the video, the last few attempts when those guys tried to change the inlay, there were huge hunks of ebony that were broken off. Now that's all taken care of now, but I'm just saying a little extra precaution. I've crushed that bead. I've got a beautiful fit here. We are going to drop in there with our wood glue to swell the end grain of the saw kerf on both sides. Let this sit overnight and we're ready to do our final dressing. Here we go, we got our over radiused fret and we're sending it home. Scoop up that glue squeeze. Still wall it nice and clean. Oh, I'm liking that too. Okay, so we'll let that set overnight and we'll come back tomorrow and finish all our fret finessing. Just get some approximate dimensions here first. So essentially what we've done here is we've created a spacer washer out of brass and what that is doing is it's buying back some extra threads on that truss rod adjustment. If you remember earlier in the video I actually loaded that truss rod. We've just bought back more adjustability than ever. This neck will always be able to be adjusted. I love it when a job goes this cleanly. I barely had to touch those frets. So the fingerboard leveling and that gentle sort of compound radius with just a little bit of fall off at the top end, this is as close to perfect as we could possibly get. So now I can carry on, buff it out, and we are getting closer by the minute to stringing this up and playing it.
think of what those frets look like at the beginning of this video, those original frets. We've come a long way. We've got about 49, 50 thou of fret wire there. With all the work that went into replacing those inlays, they were covered up during the whole fret dressing process. And we are just getting ready to get to work on the, the bridge radius and the intonation. All right, so we had to take a little bit of a detour with this L5 because for a couple of reasons. We're not getting an intimate fit to the soundboard with this original foot. It needs to be altered. Problem is, we have the original script L-5 and the serial number on the underside of the feet of this original foot. Also, you can see there's a piece sort of broken away here. So what we've opted to do, I'm going to make a replica of this foot. To get this profile, I started with this piece of oak. I did check it against the actual bridge, so we got a pretty close replica here. Once we establish that with the oak, then I've got some ebony stock. And that's kind of where we're going with this. This is what we ended up with. There's our replica bridge and the original bridge. I experimented uh, with this piece of quarter sawn oak first, and then I proceeded to make that ebony cross-sectional profile. This is for the replacement foot. The original bridge, it was split underneath, but as you can see, this is the history of this guitar. So in order for me to get this original bridge to actually seat perfectly, these telltale signs from 90 years ago, that serial number and our little L5 script would need to disappear. So after consulting with the customer, we decided to go this route to make a replacement bridge based on the model of the original bridge with all the adjustability necessary to put the action and intonation exactly where we need it. Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here at Stratford, Ontario, Canada for String Tech Workstations. Before this 1929 L5 goes back to the customer, I wanted to go over the whole thing, kind of show you what we did, and point out some of the details that were indicative of this era. One of the things that I found quite beautiful is the, the actual taper of the headstock. So we go from 5 eighths of an inch down to 7 sixteenths. It's just one of those beautiful details that, that you don't see in production guitars. Even the back of the neck, the way the sculpting kind of sweeps up gracefully to that point. This is one of the things that shouldn't have been done, that was done. These are the original heads. I did actually oil them and put some lithium grease on there. I'm going to clean it up before it goes back to, to the customer. This is actually a five-piece neck. So you've got the, the two book match pieces of maple, center strip of walnut, and then the ebony fingerboard. There's a shot of the back, that beautiful burst. The kerfing has actually slipped. The side is actually flexing, so I'm going to wick some hide glue in there. The way I've got this set up is the leather straps and that strip of rubber pull the side in very gently. I'm not forcing anything. We'll wick the hide glue in there and then let that set. So this is the replacement foot that I fabricated because the original one had the serial numbers on the bottom. So we got a beautiful fit all the way around, intimate contact. Lots of adjustment on those thumb wheels. You can see by the marks on the top that this has been on and off God knows how many times over the last 90 years. Anyways, a nice fit all the way around and it's been completely intonated for these strings that uh, the customer's chosen. And of course we've got all new frets and we replaced that inlay, repaired the fingerboard. Okay, what we're doing here is the side has slipped loose of the kerfing. So I've got it set up so that those straps are actually pulling that in tight. You've got to be careful. You cannot put too much pressure on an instrument of this age. The last thing you want to do is crack the top or the side. So I heated up the hide glue. Underneath there I've got a hockey puck. That hockey puck naturally flexes to the shape of the side. And those straps are tightened and pushing that side in where it's loose and holding it while I wick some hide glue into that joint. After all these years, we've gone to a canvas strap instead of leather. So with the canvas, it really doesn't matter anymore what the dimensions are because you can make a 
canvas strap any size you want. Okay, so that's what we got. We're going to let that sit for about an hour or so. This one is essentially done. As you've heard me say in other videos, this is the beauty of high glue. It does not stick to lacquer, and if you get it at the right time, I can just peel it off with my finger. Yeah, so that's whipped in there good and tight. It's no longer flexing. This had been drilled out previously. I reamed it out with the cello reamer and then made a matching plug for the perfect uh, taper. Now that we've got a perfect match, we can just push that into place. Okay, now that that's set, I'm using a brad point bit for centering. Okay, here's our slightly larger bit. We're still going with the brad point. So now we just ream that open ever so slightly and then try our pin and a little tiny bit more. placement perfectly fitted bridge 100% contact all the way across that arch it's actually sitting a lot more evenly than the last bridge which obviously someone took a run of that original bridge several times and Denny had chosen to go with a a 14 first string tons of jam and an 18 plain second string basically a Martin 12 to 54 strings but the top two strings are replaced with a 14 plane and an 18 plane. Great choice. It intonates wonderfully. And the uh, machine heads were kind of lubricated so they're now they're not creaking and, and grabbing. They're surprisingly 90 year old machine heads. Beautiful. Nice and smooth to turn and keep the string perfectly in tune. Beautiful sounding guitar. I mean, there's war wounds to be expected with the brand new frets and, and all those crumbling inlays replaced, fingerboard leveled, 
and the replacement foot of the bridge fits perfectly across that arch. We've got 100% contact. You can hear the amplitude. Listen to that first string. This is just the camera mic. Super fast attack. And that's it for the 1929 L5.